a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. The gathering is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for a couple more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, then I felt right at home. I'm not sure. I believe everything you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for a bunch of wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? You can come to our church even if you were or are Catholic, mm -hmm. Baptist, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon. A little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. A fella. A doubter. New to Jesus. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where no one is perfect. Beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where it's okay to not be okay. Really. Well, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the gathering. Great to have you with us this morning. I think summer's finally arrived. Is that, can we, yeah, yes, yes. Spring, yeah, something, but the weather is beautiful. We had a yard sale yesterday and uh, just enjoyed the sun and meeting lots of people and uh, it was just so great to be outside and temperature was perfect and so... I want to thank you for joining us this morning. If you're new, my name is Corey, and I just want to welcome you and just invite you just to relax. Um, our service, uh, one of the things we say regularly is no perfect people allowed, and uh, that uh, our goal is to create a space where people can explore faith at their pace. So we just want you with that to relax. If you are new and want to connect, we have a connection card, looks like that, either in the seat in front of you or behind you. And if you fill this out after we finish, singing this morning. We'll take a break where you can get more coffee and you can turn that into our guest service. We've got a great gift bag for you with a Yaks gift card and some other goodies in there. And I uh, just want to welcome you and just assure yourself that you're, uh, you're in good hands and a safe, safe place. So with that, uh, if you want to stand with me and let's pray and we'll jump into our singing. Good to see you, brother. Uh, Jesus, we thank you uh, for this beautiful day. Uh, it is a day that you made. And uh, this morning, we choose to be glad in it. God, I just pray. In fact, right now, everybody just take a deep breath. Just a big, deep breath. Just kind of release the stresses or the worries of the week. And we just, the Holy Spirit, invite you into this place. But help us this morning to trust that you love us, desire to be in a relationship with us accept us right where we're at. Amen. As we begin worship, <clears throat> just pause a minute. This first song, I was thinking it just felt like a prayer, like an opening prayer kind of to present ourselves to the Lord, to say, here we are, just as I am. We don't have to pretend to be anything else. Whatever was happening this morning or yesterday, just let it all go and present ourselves to the Lord. <clears throat> 
trust you, God. Speak what is true. Speak what is true. Higher than 
Holy Spirit, we call out to you. We need you. We need you, Jesus, in our lives. There's so much hurt, so much struggle in this life. But I know that you see every bit of it. You've felt it before. You're with us every step. And you're calling us out, calling us into faith to just trust. To just trust that you have what is best for us always. Help us to believe in your words, Lord. Help us to believe in your love.
I've heard the accusation and I've heard the propaganda. I've heard the lies they whispered to my soul. That I have been forsaken and I'll always be forgotten. No matter what I do, it's not enough. On 
somebody back there. Am I on? Can you hear me? Well, I, I've got a loud voice, so. Yeah, I was just going to say, have a seat. See if you're all right. Let's just take a moment and want to sit in this, this space. Let's just take a deep breath. Breathe in the Holy Spirit. And blow out all the stress and worries from this week, anything that we carry. The song that says, My eyes or above the waves made me think about the story where Peter is in the boat and there's a storm and they look and see Jesus walking on the water. They think it's a ghost, but then they recognize it's Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, you can come out of the boat and walk on the water, walk to me. I was just thinking about that picture, what it looks like. And there's a raging storm all around me. But I keep my eyes above the waves and I keep my eyes on Jesus. It's when we take our eyes off Jesus and start looking at the storm that we start to drown and we start to fall. But even when we fall, he reaches his hand out and he said, I'm with you, you're not alone. Take my hand. Jesus, take my hand. Help me keep my eyes on you. And not the storm. Because there will always be storms. But I choose to keep my eyes on you. And I choose to take your hand. never taken the hand of Jesus, I invite you today, let this be your step of faith, to reach out, and take his hand, and walk with him as the guide, the director, the love of your soul, he wants to walk with you, so you are never alone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Charity. <laughs> well, if this is your first time at the gathering, I want to thank you, first of all, for trusting us. It's always a little intimidating to walk into a space you've never been before, not knowing what to expect. And so, Dave, I'm talking up here. <laughs> Sorry, we're very laid back around here. So, <laughs> um, No perfect people allowed. That's our motto here. And what we want to do is we want to take a break in a few minutes to just meet somebody new, get some more coffee, uh, get some tea, get some water, say hi to somebody. And we'll also dismiss our kids. We have a wonderful kids area for them to go explore and have fun and play. So we'll do that. I just want to um, highlight two things. 
Um, oh, I, back to if this is your first time here. If you've not filled out one of these, you can fill this out, get a free gift at our guest services, and then um, that way it signs you up to our email list if you want that to uh, get information on what we're doing here at the gathering so you don't miss out. And then that way we can connect with you. So I hope you guys are all quiet and serious. So good to see you all. On a day like this, I never know who's going to be here because it's like the mountain is calling, you want to be outside, you want to go on a hike, totally, right? You get it? You just, so to come inside takes a, it takes a determination and I appreciate you guys coming, so thank you. And we won't keep you here long. So we're going to take a break in a few minutes and we'll come back and Corey's got something fun to share with you guys and then uh, we'll send you out to enjoy the sun. We, um, as many of you know, we have a campus in Wairika that we are starting. It's going to be the Gathering Wairika. And a bunch of guys have been up there working and remodeling, and so we'll be giving you more information as that is coming our way. And then we have a school that we're starting in the fall. So um, that's pretty exciting, and so you can get more information. Mike and Lacey, you want to wave right here? They are overseeing the school, and um, it's going to give an option for families uh, if they want another option for a school opportunity. So, and then the last thing I'm going to share with you is that we are a nonprofit, so it's because of your generosity that keeps uh, the lights on and keeps us able to do all the activities that we do, and I wanna thank you. If you wanna partner with us financially, there's different ways you can do that, um, online or in person. So with that, take a break, and we actually ring a bell when it's time to come back in here, because we get so busy talking, we lose track of time, and uh, then you can come back in. So yeah, five minutes, go.
Well, good morning, if you want to find a seat. You'll forgive me if I'm sucking on some honey and ginger here. I, uh, I sang myself horse Friday. Yeah, no, it was incredible. We had a spirit-filled Friday. We do the third Friday of every month. And uh, it was just, towards the end, it's like, man, I just, it was, uh, I haven't, I literally sang myself hoarse. Um, so, anyway, so I'm not sick. You won't catch anything from me except maybe a little joy bug or something, but uh, <clears throat> that's the worst I can give you, hopefully. So, well, hey, good to have you guys. Thanks for being here. Um, this morning, I want to, um, it was kind of funny when Kristen said, uh, Corey's got something fun for you. I'm like, well, not to start with. Um <laughs> But, uh, you know, it probably will mean nothing to most of you, but uh, Tim Keller passed away day before yesterday, and he was probably, uh, for the last 20 years, one of the formative long-distance mentors for me uh, around um, theology and, uh, and what they call orthopraxy, or the practice of how we, how we do life and faith and church, and just was a a great leader um, in the, really in this, the, the, the voice of compassion and connection with culture. And um, anyway, I have a couple slides, just a couple of quotes of his that I want to show you. Um, he said this, uh, George Herbert says, death used to be an executioner, but the gospel makes him just a gardener. Death used to be able to crush us, but now all death can do is plant us in God's soil. So we become, so we become something extraordinary. Grieve with hope, wake up and be at peace, laugh in the face of death, and sing for joy at what's coming. If you have Jesus Christ by the hand, and he has got you by the hand, you can sing. And if Jesus died so you don't have to pay for anything in your past, and he has risen to be your living Savior, then what can death do to you? Anyway, just a couple of quotes of, of Tim Keller, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, he was uh, very significant, influential in my life, and I discovered him at a, at a, in my early years, in my 30s, and uh, for some of you, that's in your later years, but that's, you know, as you get older, that's in your early years, and uh, yeah, he just was an incredible, he's got probably two or three of my favorite books outside the Bible ever written, and uh, one, if you're, if you're new to him or just curious about something good to read, um, probably my absolute favorite book uh, is a book called Prodigal God um, by him, and uh, uh, just a phenomenal short as well for you non-readers. Yeah, phenomenal short read. Um, and he uh, he in there he dissects the the well-known story of the parable of the prodigal son. If you haven't read the Bible, you probably read about the lost son that goes away and squanders all his father's wealth and all that. So anyway, it's a gr- phenomenal read. Uh, highly recommend it. <clears throat> All right, well, we are in a series called Eating and Drinking, and we are in part six this morning. And our title this morning is, Do You Want to Be Happy? Are you sure? Do you want to be happy? Okay, you don't, you don't have to force it if you don't. That's all right. We don't, we're not a cult. We don't make people repeat after me and if you don't want to. Um. <clears throat> But the truth of it is, behind the smile of so many people in our culture today is a well of sadness. Especially true of comedians, right? Some of my favorite comedians have taken their own own lives or overdosed. Um, John Belushi, one of the early ones, remember the Blues Brothers for those older folks out there. Um, Chris Farley, holy schnikey, anyone? and I, I, I know after Chris Farley and then John Candy, I think he just died of a heart attack, but I was like, and all my favorite fat comedians die. It's like, man, it's like who's, I mean, Kevin James is like, I think our only like heavy set comedian we got left. And I just, this is, some, you know, they're just so, 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 so joyful. Um, but probably the, the, the one that might symbolize culture uh, in our time more than any other is Robin Williams. Robin Williams. To this day, Hook is probably in my top 10 favorite films of all time. That man could bring joy, could bring joy, but behind that smile, right, there was a well of deep 
sadness. I think there's a low-grade depression in so many in our culture that it's, it's kind of become the new normal. It's kind of become the new normal. Our founding document, right, our declaration, declares that we have life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I would say for many that that pursuit feels further away than that 250-year-old document does. This morning as we jump into this, I want to suggest that maybe... Maybe it's okay to abandon the American dream and instead pursue the dream that Jesus has for your life, the vision that he has for life. Now, when you think of happiness, you, you may not think of Jesus. You might think of the Dalai Lama, I don't know, some you know, happiness guru, uh, mindfulness. Uh, and, and I don't want to, you know, put any of that down. I think there's some great psychology coming out in the culture around mindfulness that can be very, very helpful. But but for many of us, I don't think we would, when we think of who do we look to on how to have a happy life, that we would think of Jesus. And I think part of this might be by the fact that uh, we have this body of artwork from the Middle Ages, right? And before, in almost every instance of that, Jesus is sad. He's sad. Um, and often he's also really thin. Never mind that he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. Um, often he's quite Caucasian uh, as well. Um, <laughs> never mind that he was from the Middle East and in the sun a lot. <laughs> so I think perhaps that. I, I know when I was a kid in Sunday school, the only scripture verse you had, I don't know if you were, for those of you that were, depending on, you know, either benefited from or traumatized by Sunday school. Um, but the only scripture memory verse I could really ever lock on to was the, the shortest one in the Bible. Anybody? Jesus. Yeah, yeah, Jesus wept. <laughs> it was an easy one to memorize. <laughs> Jesus wept. But in reality, scripture says of Jesus that, in fact, I have it up here, it's Psalms 45 of a prophecy of of the coming Messiah, it says this, Therefore God, your God, has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than anyone else. But in fact, the Messiah was prophesied to be the most joyful human being alive. Alive. I want to jump into a story from the Gospel of John and the early ministry of Jesus and kind of pick this apart a little bit. And it's a fairly famous uh, story. It's uh, the wedding at Cana. And this will jump right in. So this is John chapter 2, verse 1. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. Now, Now start here. This is somebody that got invited to a party. All right? So just think about that. When was the last time you were invited to a party? Has it been a while? Yeah. Maybe you're a downer. Huh? Maybe. <laughs> All right, so Jesus was invited and his disciples were invited to a party. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem. Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Isn't this just the classic mother and son dialogue? I mean, this is just, it's just so real, you know. It's like, all right, mom, you know, because I love you, I'll, I'll do it. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, 
though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said, and then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. Now just for those of you about ready to throw a party, that's some party advice there, so just kind of... <laughs> The scripture is very all-encompassing, okay? It just gives you everything. But you take note of this. So when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out, brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best wine until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Now, I, <clears throat> I came to faith in a denomination that was birthed during the women's suffrage and the prohibition. Assemblies of God, Fellowship, Pentecostal, the Nazarenes, about that time, they were two, version, two, two kind of during the revivals that, that became a fellowship denomination, if you will. And so the fellowship I'm, I was a part of and, and that are, are, I'm still affiliated with uh, yeah, birth was birthed during prohibition and women's suffrage. So there's there's two there's one really good thing and one really bad thing about it. The really good thing is that our fellowship has ordained women and elevated women in leadership since from its beginning. It's just never been an issue for for our fellowship. But but part of it was culturally, right? We were birthed during suffrage and the the fight for women's rights. Uh, the other thing though is it was birthed during prohibition during a time in our country when alcoholism and opium especially were rampant in our culture and men were very, very absent and spent more time in the bars than did with their families and so you had prohibition. So it also was a, it was a fellowship that was and still is by, to some degree very anti-alcohol. To drink alcohol was a sin when I was growing up in, in the church I was growing up in. And and as much as I, I love, you know, my fellowship, right, and I, and I do to this day, I've stayed with it, but it's everybody's human, right, and we're all human, and there were whole books written about this scripture on how it was really just grape juice, and I remember reading, uh, I, I think, a, a different translation at some point in my teens or early 20s, maybe even after we were first married, and I was just like, okay, wait a minute, you know, because in the King James, it's more vague, but in, in this, it's like, okay, that, you know, they bring out the least good wine when everybody's had a lot to drink. Well, why would you do that if it was grape juice, right? Anyway, um, so this is just very clear, but it, it, it's, it's just one of those, you know, it's just one of those funny things that, that, that we as humans do. So, two things I want to point out from this. That this was a miraculous sign. A sign is, is, is something to pay attention to or a revelation. A revelation. That something significant is happening, pay attention. And, and the writer John is clear of this. This was a miraculous sign at Cana of Galilee. It was the first time that Jesus revealed his glory. You want to throw that back up? <clears throat> first time that Jesus revealed his glory. Now, if you think of that term glory, it's an, kind of an old, older English term, and you, you might think of the cliche glory to God. And, and, and you might go, I actually really have no idea what that means, what that means. But when you think of this, don't think so much of that cliche, but think of the fact that the, the glory is God's presence and person. So Jesus, by turning the water into wine, this miracle revealed the presence of God in their midst. It revealed the very presence of God in their midst. And we can ask a question from this. So what is God like? What is, what is God like? What do you, if you could answer that, and don't, don't, I'll ask you some questions later you can answer, but, but think to yourself, what is God like? Well, I'll tell you what he's like. He's like someone that gets invited to a party and makes the very best wine possible. That's what God is like. John Mark Comer says that, that Jesus is the sommelier of heaven. Now, if you have to look up that word, like I did, you know, you're okay. But like the wine connoisseur, right? Someone that, that knows good wine and made the very best wine. That Jesus took the very molecules that he showed himself 
to have power over the very molecular structure of the universe. Who could do that but the one that created the universe? The one that created the universe. See, joy is actually one of the central teachings of Jesus. And if this is a struggle for you and you grew up in, you know, a church or whatever, I, I want to encourage you to, it, it is for me, too. it ha was for me too. Because I just didn't hear this. John 15, 11 says this, Jesus saying this, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. John 17, 13 says this, Now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that you may have my joy, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. But this is a central teaching of Jesus to his present followers when he's walking among them. And it's something in this John 17, what they call the high priestly prayer, that he prays for all of the followers down through the millennia. So there's two realities about joy. One, that God is the most joyful being in the cosmos. And two, Jesus is the very incarnation in the flesh, God. And that Jesus, therefore, was and is the happiest person alive. That he has, actually has a lot to teach us about how to be happy, how to have a happy life. If you look at the opening verses of the Bible of Genesis, you find in there really that opening sequence is song. It's poetry. That God is singing with joy the very universe into existence. And he's saying, it is very good. I can't sing when I'm not hoarse, so I'm not even going to try. But it is very good. Charity, where are you at? Come sing. No, it's very good. It's very good. <laughs> Say, I told you. It's bad. But God is singing the very universe into existence. There's a G.K. Chesterton quote, and he was an old, a long dead British theologian, but it's probably one of my favorite quotes of his of all time, and how it brings out this idea of God's delight and joy. <clears throat> you may have heard it as I read it. You might get it. And we'll have it on the overhead here. It says this, Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. <laughs> For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but he has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. You see, at the center of the cosmos is a God who is happy. And if that's messing with you, let it mess with you. Because this, I tell you, this whole series, but this, this is a foundation stone for hospitality, for living a life of joy in Jesus. That if you miss this and you're Christianity or religious experience, this, this is something we need to get. It, it has the potential to transform, terraform your heart if you let it. Let it mess with you. At the center of the cosmos is a God who is happy. If you could do something for me for a minute, just close your eyes. You don't have to if you don't want to, but you do what you want. Your mouth shasta, right? Close your, okay, now do this. Think of the most beautiful place you've ever been. Okay, somebody have it? Okay, shout it out. What? Forest Lawn. Forest Lawn. Forest Lawn. Angel's, Trail. Angel's Trail. 
Glacial trails. Your backyard, no. Oh. Hawaii. What what island? Kauai. Ocean. The ocean. Sedona? Lake Tahoe, Montana? Car- Carmel? Kona. Kona. Uh oh, we got an island fight going on. Kona. <laughs> Capri, ooh, not been yet. Oh, how many hundreds of thousands of people come right here every year to see our beauty, right? Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful, it's beautiful. Okay, now let's do do another exercise. Close your eyes again if you would like. And now think. Let me take a deep breath first. Relax, clear your mind. Open your heart. Think of the happiest moment in your life. Okay, anybody? Shout it out. Family dinners. Samantha. Okay. Birth of your sons. Oh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Anybody else got one? Oh, don't be. Shopping with your mom. That's impressive. That. That's. We. <laughs> we are all different, aren't we? That. Thank you, charity. That. I think I'd rather get a root canal, but I don't know. Maybe it's just your mom that's really fun, not the shopping part, right? Is it just anything with your mom, maybe? Marriage. Marriage. Who said that? Oh, Linda. I thought my wife said it for a second. I'm like, I, don't know. I was like, oh, really? You think that? Oh, that's, I'm, so, I'm so encouraged. Tea time. Oh, like high tea? No, just tea time. Remember to go up and stay in Ashland Springs Hotel? They do tea there, I think, high tea or something. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Puppies. Oh, newborn. Any newborn. Like there's all the little, like, lamb videos on, you know, whatever social media feed, and they're all bouncing around. It's just so adorable. I tell you, one thing I love, I love quail. We've got a quail trail right by our backyard to a neighbor who feeds them, and it's awesome. And I just love quail. Might be our air conditioner about ready to blow up. I don't know, but you're safe, I'm sure. I think it's a helicopter, huh? It is. Oh, it's the ant behind me. We're going to live. <laughs> Whose moment right now is the happiest in their life when you found out you're going to live? Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't have did that any better if we planned it. Uh, <laughs> okay, now think of this. So whatever God's relationship to space and time is, and, and, and theologians differ on this. If just Go read Greg Boyd, if you need a respected theologian. He's got a really different perspective. So theologians, very smart people, disagree on whatever, what God's relation is to space and time. But whatever it is, right, it's, it's quite different from ours. Right? It's quite different from ours. And I would submit to you that whatever it is, there is no place that God is not. Past, present, future. For me... Um, I, I was thinking through this, and I'm, I'm a kind of a naturally happy person, is that right? Positive person, I guess. Um, my wife is nodding, okay, so that's affirmative. Um, naturally insecure person, is that? <laughs> um, so I don't, you know, I, I, uh, but what I find is that I, I had a hard time living in the moment, especially when my children were born. I have three kids, and 33, 31, and 29, 8. Um, I was 21 when my son was born, and 
we had just been, I, th- I just started working after being laid off and no medical insurance. And I was, to be honest, I was stressed out. I was like, you know, she was all excited and I was like, I've got another mouth to feed. You know, like, I don't know. Um, so I, I wasn't really, and then, I, and then from there I went to, I did, kind of did it backwards, went to college, worked two jobs while she ra- kind of helped raise the kids. And I was gone a lot from the first two kids when they were little. And I realized playing with my, my Rachel, my youngest, when she was, you know, before she could walk and stuff, I realized how much of that age and stage I had missed with my own children. Uh, and I just was not where I was at mentally, and, and I was not able to enjoy those moments. And that's a, it's a regret, you know. Um, but I'll tell you this, and in fact, I got a picture of, of for me, uh, certainly recent, is when Phoenix, my granddaughter, was born. And uh, oh, I, t- I think I held her when she was about 25 minutes old. And she locked eyes with me. I mean, looked like, like b- burrowed into my soul. Uh, y- you know, like, you know, like the, the, the vampire and werewolf and what's that book series that um, Twilight do, you know, or whatever that. I mean, I, you know, it was just, it was, I, I, it was, it was a, uh, a spiritual experience. I, I have this 25-minute-old human being look at me, and the love I felt we exchanged is just, I, I just can't even explain it. In fact, I was talking to a lady uh, yesterday, and she's like, I, uh, she's Iranian, so she's got this great accent, you know, I love my grandkids so much more than my children, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know why, I just, uh, you know. <laughs> And I was like, I, I kind of get it, you know? It's like, maybe because you're older and you can relax and enjoy them, and when they're poopy or crying, you can hand them back, you know? I don't know, but uh, it, it's, oh my goodness. Uh, my youngest daughter, Rachel, and her husband live in Maui, and, uh, and she just, uh, I was thinking probably on Instagram or something, but she sent a video of a newborn whale. She's out, her husband works on one of those boats that whale watches and snorkels and stuff, so she, she gets to go out all the time. It's, you know, a terrible life. Pray for him, you know? Um, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, she sent a video of this newborn whale, just like, just, what do they call that? Breaching, just breaching and breaching and breaching, just, just, just ecstasy, or just joy and right, and you see like the lambs, like I saying, just this utter joy in creation, and God is, God is at the birth, was at, and is at the birth of your children, right? At your marriage or your engagement, he is there. He's in that moment. He is with that baby whale as, as it's breaching with joy of being alive. He is there. He is in all those places, feeling all that joy and wonder of the moment. Oh, back for a visit. No, no, he's, he's, he's headed out this time. Oh, babies, right? Oh, love them. Love them. But here's the thing, and you might be thinking this. If he's in all of those moments of joy and ecstasy, then the opposite is true, right? He right now is in Bankmut, Ukraine, right? One of the cities that's experienced the most death and starvation and shelling and the the war there. And he's also in Pattaya, Thailand. You may not know about that. My daughter went and served there working in the sex trafficking, not served there as a missionary working with the sex trafficking. Uh, It is the capital of the world for child prostitution. Dark place dark place. And he is in all those places. If he's at your wedding day, at the birth of your children, right, at that moment by the ocean or the sunset, he was in the concentration camps and the killing killing fields of Cambodia. See, before the prophecy that said Jesus was full of joy, Isaiah said this, that he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest 
grief. Acquainted with deepest grief. Scripture over and over says that God is love. God is love. But it never says that God is sadness. But know this, and this is a, uh, this is a, a problem with our understanding of God and our, it's long and complicated, and I cut out the details because it's boring probably to you, but God has emotions. He is a person. We are created in his image. Right? He's not this thoughtless, feelingless, abstract nothingness in the sky somewhere. He is a person. And yet so how maybe you can say if he's in all of those dark, horrible places of humanity, how can God be happy? And I would say this, that God has the vantage point to see that sorrow and suffering will pass away. But joy will last forever. All through scripture, it says that God is love and joy. It never says that he is sadness, but there are many times when God is sad. You see, these emotions are two sides of the same coin, and I don't, I don't believe they can coexist without the other. We'd actually have no idea what happiness is, would we? We'd have no, no measurement of what happiness or joy is if there wasn't the reverse. We would be somehow, if we did not have the potential for good as well as evil, we would be subhuman, computer, right, animal. And I would say this, the sadness of God is part, not in, not in spite of or opposed to, but the sadness of God is part of the love and joy of God. You see, sadness is the normal, healthy response of a mother or father who desires good for their children or their creation, but that, that, that child is, is acted upon evilly or does evil. I have a moment I got into where one of my children disappointed me deeply, and I was so, so angry. Have you been there, parents? <laughs> oh, that's good, Frank. Frank, by the way, Pastor Frank, he's here visiting today. Good to have you, brother. Um, yeah, have you, if you've been a parent, if you, if you just, you know, if you've not been the most angry you've ever been in your life, you haven't been a parent yet of adult children, Okay. <laughs> Just give it time. Just give it time. But was my anger f towards my child, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the name and, and sex un, uh, un, undeclared, um, was that in spite of my love? No, it was because of my love. I, if somebody else would have done that, that's well, their problem. But that was my child, right? I, I care so deeply about their character and, 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 and that they choose good in their life. And when they, right, when they let you down or disappoint you, it's, it's okay to be sad. It's the natural, healthy emotion of a loving mother or father. Right, this is natural. And God is our loving Heavenly Father. Oh, goodness, so cute. Hey, don't steal my show, all right? Come on. <laughs> Actually, you're a good uh, bounce off here. There is something, and I've seen this in the, in the church, in Christianity, and in other, I see it in a lot of other religions as well. It's what I would call, and I don't call it, I, think, I don't know who calls it this, but toxic positivity. And you see, it's almost the Christians that feel like they've got to, like, there's this happy talk. I've got to, I can't say anything. I can't say I'm sick. I can't say I'm, I, you know, it's a lack of faith. That's a bunch of... You, you insert the explicative at the end. 
all right? God is, you know, the sadness. We, you know, we live in a world where there's pain and, and it's okay to admit it. You're created in the image of God with feelings. If you're never sad, it's likely you've never been really joyful or happy either. That as humans, we are created with the potential and the range of emotions. Emotions. And so don't be afraid to be sad. You know, and, and I, never more in this, in the church, in fact, one of the churches in Portland, Chris and I were just attending before I was a pastor, and, um, you know, I just remember there's this people, this couple, they just, I mean, they were perfect, Ken and Barbie couple, three cute, cute little blonde kids, both gorgeous people, seemed to have it all together, and as we got to know them, it's like, they just, they just put on this show at church, but as we got to know them, became friends, you know, they're just, their life was a, a mess. And they were very unhappy and sad. And, and there's this, this is one of the things we've really tried to do at the gathering is create a place where you can be yourself, where it's okay to not be okay. We even say it in the video because we, we mean it. We want to mean it. That ignoring sadness, <laughs> oh, he's going for the instruments. Ignoring sadness does not make it go away. Does not make it go away. But to know this, that sadness is not the end of the story. See, Jesus' plan for your life is to grow you into a joyful, as joyful a person as he is. As joyful a person as he is. Jesus' desires for your life, Jesus' desire for your life is that joy becomes your new normal. But here's where we go wrong. See, joy is not just an emotion, but an overall condition of your heart. An overall condition of your heart. And Scripture teaches that our heart is three things. It's our feelings it's our thinking and our will, or to say that differently, what we want, that it comprises these three things. So your heart is what you think about, what you feel, and what you desire. And I want, to, I want you to pay attention here because this, this is critical. Most of us are taught that we find happiness in the external things, right? The things out there will make us happy. Get a new toy, Get a new boyfriend, right? A new girlfriend, a new spouse maybe, right? <laughs> then I'll be happy. Never mind that your picker's broken and you just, you know, he's, his name's Bob, but he's just like Dave, you know? Any, anybody had an aunt like that, just five husbands, and they're all different names, but same guy. <laughs> Abusive, you know? And, uh, you know, and we think this, right, in the culture, I mean, it, right, in, in, you know, in the algorithms and everything, they sell you, man, they'll sell you. You just buy this shiny new thing and you'll be happy. But it's a lie, right, and you know it because three days after you get that shiny new thing, you're like, huh. Jesus wants to grow you into the kind of person who is joyful, where joy becomes the condition of your heart. That you become joyful through your followership, through your discipleship, through your apprenticeship to the happiest person alive, Jesus. So that when you don't get your way, when somebody cuts you off on the, on the road, right? Instead of pointing them to Highway 1, you just say, bless you, brother, right? Anybody got a little work to do on that? Yeah, me too. Um, but right, but that's, that's the goal of Jesus, right? To get you to the place to where you don't just like fake it till you make it and just like put on the permagrin, you know, the church smile, whatever you want to call it, but that you actually, the overall condition of your heart is joy so that when you're doing the most mundane task, you're walking in joy and it's available to you as a follower of Jesus. So the question is, how do we do that? I'm really out of time.
All right. Let me cry uncle when you're done listening to me. Okay. There's a command that runs all through the New Testament, especially by Paul. And this command is rejoice. And he said in Philippians, and Philippians, he wrote the letter to Philippi when he was in prison, and it's kind of one of the most famous scriptures. This, it says this, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. It's a command. I say it again, rejoice. The message version, uh, it says a little, even a little clearer, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him, right? <laughs> revel in him. Rejoice is a, a verb, it's a command to joy. Literally means to joy. It's almost always in the plural, commanding the followers of Jesus to celebrate. With the, and it implies to, to celebrate with a feast, with a meal, with a party together. It's almost always plural, meaning do it together. If you've been wondering, if you've been around the series on we're eating and drinking and hospitality, where is he going to get hospitality? This is, here we are. Right? Rejoice is a command to party together. So followers of Jesus should be known as the best partiers, <laughs> not the worst. <laughs> now, <clears throat> you, know, you, you, you know, you understand where I'm coming from, right? There's massive abuse of drugs and alcohol and food and everything. We abuse everything. We're just Americans. We're fabulous at abusing everything. So moderation is the key, but man, you can still party in moderation, okay? Remember this. What is the first way Jesus revealed his glory and presence as the creator God? At a party, making really good wine. I want, to, I want to submit to you as we kind of wrap up, was this just a one-off? Was this just a coincidence? Was this not meant for us to pay any attention to? In fact, this was the very first time he revealed the gl very glory of God. I, I, would, I would think it's something we should pay attention to. That celebrating the goodness, love, and grace of God together and inviting strangers and making them friends and then making friends family as we learn how to do life and celebrate the goodness of God together. Now, maybe you don't see God as joyful and that that is his plan for you. I looked up a definition in the Urban Dictionary. You got this on there? Declan, fun sucker. Fun sucker. A person who takes the fun out of absolutely everything by being extremely whiny, annoying, bitchy, moody, strict, uptight, etc. People who are like this are a real drag. So maybe you view, don't view God as joyful. Maybe you, you view God as a fun sucker. Maybe granted, when I was a kid, I kind of did. Like, yeah, God, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, serve you when I'm done partying, you know, but I, you know, you're, you're, you're just a killjoy. Maybe you view him as an uptight, rigid, legalistic perfectionist. I would submit to you that's more, had more to do with your authority figures than God. Because this God I serve in Jesus, he gets invited to the parties, makes the best wine, and stays till the end. Celebrating, celebrating. I'm going to finish with a quote from Lord of the Rings. Yay. This, uh, <laughs> thank you, all one of you. Uh, this, this is uh, a, probably my most beloved uh, book uh, after the Bible. Um, I only say that because I have to. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a pastor who preaches from the Bible. Um, this is the story, uh, I, I, does everybody kind of know the premise, right? Really bad things happen and, and, you know, the hobbits go and save the, the world and the universe, yeah. Um, Sam, one of the hobbits, you know, Frodo and Sam, they have to take the ring to Mount Doom, very scary journey to end, you know, evil in Middle Earth. 
And this is after that happens. Sam, when Sam awoke, he found that he was lying on some soft bed, but over him gently swayed wide beechen boughs, and through their young leaves sunlight glimmered. Who doesn't love that? Tolkien, man, he just, man, he can write. Green and gold, all the air was full of sweet, mingled scent. He stretched and drew a deep breath. Why, what a dream I've had, he muttered. I'm glad to be awake. He sat up, and then he saw that Frodo was lying beside him and slept peacefully, one hand behind his head and the other resting upon the blanket. It was the right hand, and the third finger was missing. Full memory flooded back, and Sam cried aloud, It wasn't a dream. Then where are we? A voice spoke softly behind him, in the land of Ithilien and in the keeping of the king. And he awaits you. With that, Gandalf stood before him, robed in white, his beard now gleaming like pure snow in the twinkling of the leafy sunlight. Well, Master Samwise, how do you feel, he said. Sam lay back and stared with open mouth, and for a moment between bewilderment and great joy, he could not answer. At last he gasped, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Is everything sad going to come untrue? That is the vision God sees into the future that we can grab a hold of. And in spite of everything that life throws at us, one day we will be in the keeping of the king where there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. That'll all be done away with. Death itself will be done away with. And yet we will have a great adventure awaiting us for eternity. That is God's vantage point and our hope. Worship team, would you come? Jesus. Jesus says to us in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, he says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. See, from the opening pages of Scripture, God's command was eat, to the final command in Revelation, drink. All through it is a table that God has set for us. And in inviting us to join him in his feast and bringing God's kingdom to earth. And he's just asking, he's inviting you. Jesus is standing at the door of our hearts and knocking. Will you Join me in a meal as friends. If your view of God is one of a fun sucker, I want to give you an opportunity to be healed of that and and maybe repent of that today. That you see God as the most joyful being in the universe who is inviting us into a life with him. Maybe you think, well, I'd like to tell people about my faith, but I think God's a fun sucker, so I don't want to. <clears throat> you can change that. If you, we, if you view God as the most joyful being who's inviting you into a life of joy, how much easier is that to invite people to the party instead of to the whipping? I mean, right? What, you grew up in a church that invited you to a whipping. They got the wrong God. They just flat have the wrong God. Jesus invites us to a party. Now there's repentance, there's confession, there's there's crap in our lives we need to own and get rid of, but he doesn't exclude us from the invitation. He says, come come to me, I'm inviting you into life, into a meal, and we'll work that stuff out together. Not me standing back and just smacking you when you get it wrong. No. Arm in arm. Arm in arm is Jesus' offer. Over a table with a meal, over bread and wine, 
as friends. That's the invitation to us. A life beyond any life you could imagine with Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're not like other gods, capricious and mean, but that you're a God that we don't have to go looking for. You actually came looking for us and that you're knocking, you're standing and knocking at the door of our hearts, waiting for the invitation, waiting for us to invite you in so that you can do life with us, share a meal with us, that you want us in, and you invite us into that life of joy. And you call us to turn enemies into friends and sit at the table with them and invite them into that life, into the party. And if we have had a view of, I encourage you now, if your, your view of God has been one of capricious or that he's invited you to a whipping and not a feast, just, just, just confess that right now. Say, Lord, forgive me for just viewing you so wrong. Forgive me and help me to see you as the most joyful being in the universe. Amen. Well, if you want to stand with me this morning, we're going to sing one song and do communion. <clears throat> and uh, we'll also have a couple people up here that would be happy to pray with you, get prayer team, and invite you to come right up uh, as communion starts. Um, let me just pray over our communion. For us, communion is open. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have to be a member here or anything like that. It's just open for you to take. It's self-serve. So just take it at any time during this song. And... Um, and then I'll come back up and we'll get you out of here. So let me pray over these elements. Jesus, we thank you for this juice. It's grape juice, unfortunately. We thank you for it, God. <clears throat> thank you for this bread. They both symbolize the great sacrifice. The, in fact, you said, but before the joy set before you, you endured the cross, scorning its shame, because you had a vantage point that we didn't have. You had a vantage point that death didn't have, that evil didn't have. And so you joyfully endured the shame of the cross for our salvation. And this juice represents your shed blood and this bread, your broken body that was shed and broken for us, for our healing, for our joy, so that we could enter into life with you that begins now but lasts for all eternity. A life of joy of adventure and feast. Thank you for these elements that symbolize so much love and sacrifice on our behalf. Amen. Feel free to take communion at any time.
Jesus, we thank you for this new life, God, this opportunity, God, this joy that we can walk in. Help us to take, take from this morning this truth that you indeed are joyful and happy and that you desire to enter into that life with you. Amen. Amen. We got to have some Spotify music going uh, in the background, and so there will still be people up here if you'd like prayer, if you don't feel a need to rush off, but those of you who need to go. So I want to encourage you, we've got some great stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, something I'm going to connect on this idea where psychology and scripture line up on joy. So you don't want to miss that. God bless you guys. Also, I have a handout on the discipline of celebration out there at the table. Love to give you on your way out. So God bless you guys. Have a great, great week.